Well, fortunately, our three panelists here today, Monica Beglow, Jay McPhail, and Darlene Rankin, all have a bit of experience in all of this. I can't promise that the next 50 minutes will address all of your questions, but I'm confident that after we wrap up, you'll be a little closer to answering that first one. Where do you start? A bit more about our panelists. First next to me, Monica Biglow has been Executive Director of the Partnerships for Education Renewal at the University of Missouri and at the University of Wyoming, as well as an elementary principal in Cheyenne, Wyoming. In 2011, the International Society for Technology and Education, or ISTE as most of us know it, uh, recognized her as a 2011 outstanding leader. She's currently the Executive Director of the EMINTS National Center at the University of Missouri in, in Columbia. Yes, sir. Uh, and that program recently won a highly competitive Investing in Innovation, or I3, federal grant. Monica also oversees the eLearning for Educators online professional development program. Next to her is Jay McPhail, who is the director of K-12 Instructional Technology and Career Technology Education for the Riverside Unified School District in California. After coming to teaching as a second career at Paris High School in the Paris Union High School District. Now, how far apart are those districts? Uh, about 30 minutes. Okay. But Southern Cali? Yes. Okay. Uh, his understanding of technology and its transformational potential led to his appointment as tech director at Paris Union in, 20, in 2004, mm -hmm. before Riverside hired him as an instructional services specialist in instructional technology. In that role, McPhail won two highly competitive EETT, or Enhancing Education Through Technology, federal grants for the district. And last but not least, on the far side of the stage, is Darlene Rankin from the Katy Independent School District in Houston's western suburbs, which has been recognized nationally for technology innovation. In her 21st year in public education, Darlene is the Director of Instructional Technology at Katy, a fast growth district with a current enrollment of 61,000 students. And, and when we say fast growth, I mean, you sent me the figures and it was 31,000 about 10 years ago, something like that? Exactly. So, yeah. so doubling in the doubling. time it takes a student to go from kindergarten to 10th grade. Right. <laughs> uh, the district uh, is in the early stages of offering filtered public Wi-Fi to allow students in grades 2 through 12, as well as their teachers, to bring their own devices for class use. This follows a mobile learning initiative across many of the district's elementary schools. So, you know, we have this question of, of beginning your digital journey, and I know Jay and, and Darlene are, are perhaps further along than some of you might be, but, but they all had to start somewhere. And before they started, they had to make the choice of, of why do you start and why are you making this jersey? So, journey, sorry. So, so Monica, since you work with so many districts across Missouri that are at so many different stages, uh, I'd like to ask, to start off with you, why should we begin this journey? What is, what is the purpose of this journey? Well, I think so many of us have heard the conversation about digital natives and digital immigrants. Uh, if you haven't, just Google that and take a good read of it. But our learners that are coming to us in public school, K through 12, and then as they reach uh, higher education, post-secondary, there, there's a whole difference in the way students look at, consume, and produce uh, work. And that's because there's a, been a major shift out in the real world uh, where lots of people work uh, using technology. And I think we need to help our students keep pace with and understand how to use technology in, in very productive and meaningful ways. So productive and meaningful. Darlene, what does productive and meaningful mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess I just want to ask everybody a question. And... Um, how many of you have had to produce a poster board or a construction paper project recently? <laughs> you, you just don't, but you're, you're actually, oh, well, okay. <laughs> and, you know, I think that we're still asking our students to do that, and it's just not meaningful to them because they're having to turn this in to the teacher who's going to give them the grade, and they're just going to do it just for that grade. And why wouldn't it be better to do something online and, and in their native way to be able to collaborate and produce something for that larger audience? Which is exactly what you guys probably do today. Whenever you're asked to produce something, you're asked to produce that in a way that um, everybody can see it and everybody can contribute to it. And, and you work in those collaborative teams. Why aren't we asking our students to do those same things? And, and that's the meaning behind it to, to us. 
And, and Jay, you know, you told me a little bit about your district's journey. What are the factors when, when you decide to do this that, that you really have to think about to make sure that this effort is successful? What are, what are the first things you have to address? Well, I think there's a, a lot of factors that go into it. Uh, for us, the budget crisis was a budget opportunity. Uh, it, it meant that we could no longer do what we said we could do um, in the way we used to do it. You know, and so when there was money, it wasn't a, 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 the ability was there for us to go ahead and throw more money into it to try and keep that uh, going in that in that direction. I think the other thing for us was realizing our customers and something that you were talking about. We're if we were a business, our customers are our students. Uh, frankly, we don't run our business that way. Uh, we everything is, in fact, a lot of what I've heard this morning is input based. You know, build the infrastructure, train the teacher, do these things, and then you get to the student as opposed to who is our customer, the student. Uh, and in this environment, we're way behind. Uh, it's not like, they're, and, and they're not waiting for us. So the, those factors, budget came into it, system, our system is flawed, broken, frankly, uh, opportunity to change it, and digital content is one piece of that, but it's only a piece of that. So, so talk about the steps Riverside took to kind of re-envision content in, in a digital world. Well, the first thing that we did is we took a look at, uh, at our, our customers. We brought our customers in, we surveyed them, we talked to them in terms of uh, what do you have. In our environment, we were doing something very strange. We were confiscating students' technology. So if they brought in a smartphone or they brought in whatever type of device, we would take that, and then we would wring our hands about the fact that we couldn't provide technology to students. Um, and so we realized. Yeah, yeah, I may have to add to that. You know, that was our summer school fund. We're not. We're no longer charging fifteen dollars for those mobile learning devices, or I'm sorry, cell phones that we're picking up. Um, so yeah, our summer school funds are kind of gone now. But hey, we're going to deal with that. Right. And remember that we, you know, part of the conversation is the budget, right? So we did what we did in Riverside. We did with no budget. Um, and so the way we were able to do that was through grants, through bring your own technology. Uh, but also open source content as well in terms of driving that conversation because our kids, there is no kid in Riverside Unified that sits down and says, I need to go to Mrs. Smith to learn algebra. Mm -hmm. They, as was mentioned earlier, they go to Google, they go to Wikipedia, they go to YouTube, uh, and they're not, they're not waiting for us. And so what we did is start looking at the, the outcome, which is student learning, and how do we maximize that by changing our system. Right. Darlene, yeah, if you don't mind if I add that a little bit, um, you know, that's what our students do when they have a bad teacher is they go to YouTube to try to figure out or to these other resources that we've given them. We've kind of created the student portal now where we're trying to deliver that to them, looking at your customer, your students, and putting it all in a framework or a dashboard for them and giving those resources to them. So that's what they do when they have this bad teacher. One of our high schools, we actually have the uh, principal there that is uh, requiring, and you know, I know that's a little, but how do you get your teachers to that point? Anyways, he's requiring his teachers to put all the smart board podcast, video cast out on, the, on their web. So now our kids at the other five high schools are going to this one high school to be able to get the information they need to know for, for that. And going back to that initial question is just, uh, you know, about seeing, um, uh, you know, this change in, and uh, the success in the journey. Uh, it's about student choice. It, it, I will see success when I see that the students are able to make choices in how they learn that content. We have a student um, that, uh, that I've been working with. His mom came to me and said, great, you're, you're putting out the public Wi-Fi, and my son is so excited. Finally, in high school, he's going to be able to use his device in the way that he needs to. He has Asperger's, dysgraphia, dyslexia, you name it. He's just, he struggles, but he needs this device in his hand so he can have the low contrast, so he can make the print larger, so he, he can't comprehend by reading, but if it's read to him, he can comprehend it. The, the child, we, we um, uh, did a pilot at their high school, and so uh, last year with the public Wi-Fi, and he was able to bring it, his grades just went up dramatic. His mom was in front of the school board crying, saying, thank you. So it, it, just a wonderful story that I love to share with everybody. Now, Monica, you know, you, you see... Like I said, you see districts at all varying levels of, mm -hmm. of trying to give students those choices. Uh, 
There's lots of challenges right now. Financially is, is a big one. Uh, you know, I know every district is different, but how does district, and, and you work mostly with smaller districts, correct? Oh, we work with all sizes. Our I-3 grant is specifically for small rural schools right. in our state. So, so with smaller districts that maybe don't have the resources to, to provide these choices, or, or think they don't have the resources to provide these choices, how do you, how do you get them to kind of reform their thinking on this? Well, I think it's a matter more of possibility thinking rather than being um, on the exclusion side or, as Jay suggested, repurposing some of the funding that is available to you. Uh, textbook purchases, even for small districts, consume a significant portion of their budget. Um, certainly not as much as salaries and benefits, but there are other areas where they can look to see uh, if repurposing funding is possible. Always being out there on the leading edge of looking for funding and grant opportunities, and even going within a small community to work for whatever uh, business resources or even uh, agribusiness can provide. There's a lot of resources right. still out there. Can I, can I Go ahead. Uh, I think again, and it was, this was mentioned in earlier discussions this morning, is is that not only are we a business, we are now being forced to be competitive. Right. Um, and so yeah. your choice is you can sit and decide not to do anything. That's great, but you're going to be out of business. Um, the other thing in terms of system change, which you're really what you're talking about, is system change. We have tried for decades, it's a second career for me, to try and change from the top down with limited success. You want to change the system, empower your kids and parents, and they'll change the system from the other way around. And I think that's where you have that discussion. Parents have helped us find funding because they understand the worth in terms of what's happening. If we, going back to where we were, if we take the technology kids are bringing in our classrooms and we confiscate it, pigeonhole it, put it in the corner, and not use those digital resources, then our parents are going to go down the street to a charter school that allows that right. or to another district of choice in California and make that choice. So just, just in terms of the actual question of, of content and digital content, what does this mean? What does... You know, are we talking e-textbooks? Are we talking open resources? Are we talking things you might find in, in popular media or yes. services such as just, you know, <laughs> what are we talking, is it, is it all inclusive? And then from that point, how do we get to lining that up with curriculum? Well, I think, again, there's a flawed premise that used to be that, um, that the teacher was the sole pur purveyor of knowledge in the classroom, and they used the manual, the textbook, that increasingly is being built to become teacher-proof so that even if you don't know what you're doing, you can provide the content, and that's where all knowledge was contained. Well, that hasn't been true for many years. Right. Certainly, you see Monica's book. <laughs> yeah, yeah, maybe you want to tell that story. About oh, I say I, I have a prop I usually bring with me. It's a book that's about this big and about this thick. It was copyrighted in 1932, and it's called The Comprehensive High School Course Book. And the introduction of the book says that it contains all of the knowledge and skills needed for high school students. And I, you know, I don't, I'm pretty sure that wasn't true in 1932, and I'm really sure it's not <laughs> true today. Well, and I, I think the idea that we can, again, education is very much managing control. Right. In an environment where you can no longer manage and control. Um, and so do we really care if a kid's learning algebra from Khan Academy, from YouTube, or from the adopted textbook? What we should care about is the kid's learning algebra. So who's, who's providing, you know, who's routing the students to those choices? Mostly students. Students. They take them. <laughs> and, and who should be? Well, I think, again, that's our institutional. For us, in terms of a business, we should be providing those resources, vetting them, you know, doing the best job we can in terms of taking a look at them and making sure that they're not teaching the wrong concepts of algebra. Right. But the idea of, uh, of, of controlling that information is something that you've got to really step outside of because kids are not waiting. If, if you guys are familiar with the Project Tomorrow report mm -hmm. that was uh, three or four months ago, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, if you haven't read that report, read it from the lens of what sixth graders are doing when it comes to educational institutions. They're not waiting for us, folks. 
it's great that we, we can talk all day about reforming and putting things in place, but they are not waiting for us. And these are sixth graders. Yeah. Uh, in, our, in our district I left yesterday, we're handing out uh, iPods and iPads to preschool and kindergarten. Um, so the, the, the world is here, we're here, and we've got to realize to get even close to there, we've got to lose the whole idea of managed control. And those content pieces right. are everything in between. And again, using, I hate to beat the business model to death, <laughs> but uh, let the free market decide. When we put those things out, who learns best from what? And, I, and I'm not opposed to paying for content, right. but I'm starting with free content. So it might be a good time to interject with an audience question right now. Uh, those of you that, that are using you know, digital content and digital resources in, in your district, you know, who selects that content and, and who kind of shapes it for classroom use? Is it, is it your curriculum specialists? Is it your technology specialists? Is it your teachers? Is it your administrators? And upon uh, writing this question, I realized I should have maybe had one more choice, which would have been, is it your students uh, or, or a combination? So I don't know if it's possible to press F. It's probably not. But uh, if you want to abstain, I'll understand. <laughs> Well, and your curriculum specialists believe that they are. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, to give you an example, we had I, when we started going down this road. Right. Um, our curriculum spe uh, specialist in English language arts called me up, and she said, "Listen, I just came from this high school, and I walked in, and and they were teaching English from this other source, not the adopted textbook, and that can't happen." So, so Darlene, what, what you're saying is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> 3.6% of the respondents are curriculum specialists. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> well, Choice A. Yeah. Well, I <laughs> mean, you know, they believe, and and with, and they should believe that they are the ones, you know, they've written the curriculum and this is what the teachers should be using. But in reality, it's, it's not, especially for our modeling teachers uh, who are out there on the cusp where our curriculum specialists and Katie have been a little bit behind. How so? Um, we, and about three years ago, we we got them, we we trained them, we we had technology integration specialists that came in, and we built this um, this. And again, it's going from the different model, you know, starting with the curriculum specialists. But we had to somewhere start because. You know, they were developing the, the curriculum around the Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills and putting that out there. And they stay in their office and they put that information out there. But really what was happening in the classroom was something different. And so these teachers felt like they were kind of, you know, doing something wrong. Um, and until we got them up to speed, the curriculum specialist, uh, about how learning, let me tell you, it wasn't easy. I, we there were lots of battles. There were lots of conversations and hurt feelings and crying and you know all kinds of things that went on. So um, uh, it, it took us a while. And and over the past three years, that's what we have done is is we have uh, trained those curriculum specialists and and tried to get them up to speed on you know what does the classroom look like? What does the the algebra content look like with the integration of technology? And so it's just it, we're continuing those conversations and and uh, they they have come along. I mean the the math. Uh, curriculum specialists are, are now watching Dan Meyer. How many of y'all have seen Dan Meyer on, on TED? I mean, it's just phenomenal. If you want to get your teachers hooked on, especially your high school math teachers, absolutely. That's a, an, an avenue for them to, to look at. So, so are, are you guys encouraged by, by the answer of, you know, it's a combination of people? Is, is that kind of what it should be, Monica? Oh, absolutely. I think um, the more people you can bring into the mix, the better the buy-in. And, right. and then you won't have to need so much time to with Kleenex in closed rooms and so on. Uh, there's, al there's also kind of an emerging group of uh, specialists, if you will, or thinkers. Um, in some schools, I've heard them referred to as learning architects, um, people who understand both the technological side, but also have some background in the curriculum, right. who can help create the kinds of learning environments that our kids need today, um, that aren't so far out there in front of teachers that they can't feel comfortable using them, but have a lot of the student input and interest, uh, many of the interactive features. Um, I, I think we're, we're looking at it in a whole different way uh, in some school districts that are forward thinking. If, if yeah, and this is a question to you. Um, 
how much money and how much time will it take to train your teachers to become as proficient as your kids with technology? <laughs> That's a good one. We answered, going back to what but the first thing we realized is, is that that's a losing proposition. The two EETT grants you talked about, we implemented by the book from the top down and we end up with a 5% drop in student learning. Well, why is that? Because everything went on the input side and not on the outcome side. So by, by providing those resources to kids, it, it creates that system change to come back where the I have teachers every day calling me and saying, I need help. I need, to, I need some sort of professional development to get up to speed. Well, that's a whole different proposition than me sending out an email to the entire district saying, you will be at this three-day training to do this uh, in terms of what's happening. So, Jay, you had, you had talked about, you know, in choosing, you know, kind of letting the marketplace determine what content is, is seen as most effective, but, but obviously we know in education that you have to have uh, some sort of justification, some sort of proof that it's working, and and you know you have to have some sort of assessment to show that you're you're getting the the outcomes that are desired. Uh, when you do this, how do you, do any of you have thoughts about not only do, how do you assess just general student progress, but how do you assess what it is that's working? Well, I, I think we're in the early stages of that. Again, going back from the customer view, we've created what we call a student data dashboard. Okay. Uh, again, looking at our system, we were data rich in the system, but our, our customers weren't getting the data on a regular basis. Uh, and one of those, what we're calling key performance indicators, and it literally shows up when they open up their internet, it's a dashboard that's personalized to themselves. Uh, one of those indicators are things like how often they've been in the learning management system, where they went to in terms of those resources as well as things as attendance and grades and, and those type of things. But you, you turn that question like, we have to. Um, so I guess my question back to you is, why, why do we have to do that? If, if we can demonstrate that kids can master algebra or whatever mm -hmm. that, that piece is, then isn't that what we're looking for as far as an ultimate outcome? Monica, do you feel that districts maybe feel pressure to to show what is working to to the state or to you know other kind of bodies that are out there or? Oh, absolutely there's no question uh, I, I, I I'm always surprised when people you know want to have some sort of direct correlation between a device or a particular piece of technology and a learning outcome um, done lots of research at several universities and I don't know of too many studies where people have demanded to see outcome data on textbooks or library <laughs> books. Um, does a chalkboard work? Um, I, I really think, getting back to what Jay's talking about, putting the analytics in the hands of the learners is even more critical than putting it in the hands of their teachers in some cases. Uh, you know, our goal at practically every vision statement you read from a school district to a university is creating lifelong learners who are empowered to, you know, fill in, you know, you know what those say. How are we going about doing that unless we're beginning to provide them with the data like Jay is speaking of? Certainly it's important that teachers and parents and administrators have that, but until the responsibility for that learning begins to be a parent to students, there again, we're, we're creating a, a difficult position for them to be in when they get to the real world. Mm -hmm. exactly. So, <laughs> if you don't mind if I add on to that, um, you know, of course we look at test scores and behavior and attendance and all of those things, but, you know, until we really look at the formative assessments that student that teachers are giving and doing in their classrooms to guide instruction or for the teacher to facilitate that instruction in the correct way, that's that's when you have true meaning because right now, do you know what a test grade or do you know what an assessment means to a student? It's that grade that's going in the grade book when I'm still in the learning process. I haven't had time to actually take that in and, and uh, make it my own and make the connections that I've needed to make to be able to really give a grade for my knowledge. That's not my knowledge right there. That is just my still my learning process. And, you know, <clears throat> that's where the policy has to change. You don't right. have to have two test scores and four quiz grades and ten homework, you know, grades each six weeks, you know. It's just, it's just a whole revamp of the system. Uh, I'd like to shift gears for a minute, if I may. 
Can I have okay. just one, 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 one quick, I'll, 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 be, I'll be very short. Um, Where's the hook over here? We, we have, we, and I'm thinking of Christensen's work, okay? So we, we, have, we have looked at the classroom in terms of, because you asked the question, why digital? Right. Right. So we have looked at the classroom. We are ringing out every single second in terms of what we can do in that classroom. Why digital? Is because you've now extended the day right. exponentially. So I wanted to go turn to a cause that's particularly close to you. I know you've been known as an advocate of uh, open content and open resources. And, and to explain exactly what that means uh, for people that, you know, maybe use open resources all the time, but, but don't necessarily know that they're doing it. Well, we, uh, if you're not aware of CK12, you probably should take a look at them, ck12.org. Um, it's an open source publisher that, frankly, we are using as much for their open source as we are to leverage the traditional publishers. Um, and, and what we have done is we've set up Blackboard, was, or Angel was mentioned this morning, we're using something similar called Haiku. Pretty much anyone you talk to in this world is using some sort of cloud resource. It can be as simple as Google and as complex as some of these paid resources. Um, and so what we're doing is going out and looking at what's already there, CK12 being an example. Uh, what's really interesting about CK12, it goes back to the student. The student can organize the resources in a way that makes sense to them as opposed to what we think makes sense to them. Uh, things like iTunes U. You know, the, the, if, you take, if you talk to uh, John Couch, the VP of Education for Apple, he'll tell you unless you can provide something better than classroom lecture, because by the way, if you go take a look at iTunes U, you can get classroom lecture on every MIT course, then you're our, if you can't add value to that, why aren't we just using that to teach our kids? Um, things like Khan Academy, things like uh, that we haven't really talked about the whole app world. One of the first things we do is when we is talk to kids and we say, listen, we want you to learn about reading. So on your device, and we're what we call device agnostic, because uh, it can run the gamut. So on your device, find an application that you think helps you learn this. And then we take that and collect that and, and uh, collaborate in terms of the teachers and the students so that they know here's, a, here's an app that works well in terms of what's going there. So the, that open source stuff, and open source, by the way, can also include publishers, traditional publishers, right? Uh, because many of them are coming to the game. In our case, they, can, they came free because of the open source. We just simply had the, you know, you had the question about who's <laughs> vetting this stuff. They can also be creating it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so by talking to publishers who are also having a tough time, we said, listen, we want the free market to make a decision. Right now, you're not competing. So, and they brought in their resource. Now, they're real, still relatively flat. I mean, we haven't talked about robust learning objects that, right. that are interactive in the way that we want them to be. But we're getting to the conversation in terms of at least breaking up that content. So I might be able to take chapter one from Pearson and chapter three from McGraw-Hill, chapter two from iTunes U, and chapter four from Khan Academy uh, to, to get to true standards-based instruction as opposed to textbook-driven instructions. So I'd like to get the two of you's input in just a second, but first I'd like to turn it to our, our second audience question, which is uh, about open source, open resources use in, in your districts. Uh, so I will, you know, Pull out your, is it the Active Expressions remotes? I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that the first time. And power up and uh, having technical difficulties here. There we go. <laughs> so, so in your district, are you using open source educational resources as part of your curriculum? Uh, yes, no, uh, somewhat, or, or not really sure. Uh, and while you guys are voting, uh, Darlene or Monica, do either of you care to comment kind of on open source utilization you've seen? Go ahead, darling. Well, and I, I guess what we're doing right now is we're leveraging what we've already had out there. And uh, of course, taking on the Khan Academies and you know various uh, resources that, that our teachers actually find and, and recommend. And uh, then they get approved and put on the student portal. Uh, because we're still kind of in that mode. But um, 
uh, you know, the discovery education has proven to be a very successful, uh, and we've had that for years, and probably many of you have had that for years, where our students with the mobile learning devices, if they're, you know, setting a concept, uh, they can actually do a simulation with that, with that particular concept, like uh, electric currents and, and the animated vocabulary that it gives them in the, uh, the science and math world is just phenomenal. And of course, it's, it's multilingual, so uh, that definitely supports uh, KDISD in um, uh, our, I guess we're probably about 35, 40 percent, um, uh, you know, have multiple, you know, languages going on. So it's just that device that allows them to, to get there. So start looking right now at what you already have in place and what they were having to go down in, down the hallway for to get from a computer lab. Um, they can now start using, if you open it up, to using that device just as they do their pencil and paper, so. Monica. Um, I was just going to say the, the biggest part of having open educational resources is that it begins to help teachers and students see that it's not just consumption, that there's an opportunity for them to participate in the creation or the generation of new knowledge and new applications. Absolutely. Uh, yeah. the School of Journalism at the University of Missouri, you might have seen in the paper last summer, uh, one of the students created a, a very popular iPhone app, uh, app um, creating, they have app contests, a lot of universities do that. Um, and you can kind of Google some of the university apps, and not too many of them are around um, the generation of knowledge or, or things that we could really use in a K-12 setting, but the fact that there are people who are contributing now and beginning to understand, I think those will come along. And it would be wonderful to have some app contests for, uh, and I know they're out there, but have some really focused contests for students in that. So I want to get to, and, and first I'll, I'll ask, is this kind of the majority of responding saying some of the time, is, is that kind of what you guys would expect? or? Well, I think you're missing a section there. If you put students, you would chart would be across the across the road. But but I, I, that's kind of what I expect. Yeah. Uh, you know, we had talked in kind of our preparations for this about how content can't be separated from device, and we've talked a little bit about bring your own technology, and we've talked about uh, in previous sessions about one-to-one -one initiatives. Can you guys? Uh, and I guess Darlene, I'll start with you because you guys have gone from a kind of mobile learning pilot to now a BYOT environment. We know in Katie we'll never be able to supply a one-to-one -one initiative for our students, but we know that those students, especially at, at the junior high and high schools, they already have that device in their pocket. So put in the infrastructure, the filtered Wi-Fi that they can get on in class and be able to get to those resources. We already have the resources. It's just that they always had to go down the hallway to a computer lab, and the teacher may not schedule the computer lab. And, um, you know, we're already there. We already have the resources. Just get them in the hands at the time that they need them. And, I mean, I think that's the huge issue is just, you know, being able to access the resource, whether it be the textbook or the discovery education or whatever it happens to be, it just needs to be readily available to them. Jay, would you like a dissent? <laughs> well, I, I mean, I, no, I'll, 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 yeah. I, I won't rise to that particular debate, although we will we'll have to continue Absolutely. talking. Absolutely. So, um, but in terms of thinking of, I, I mentioned we're device agnostic, we're also content agnostic, but that doesn't mean you have to, you have to be smart in terms of how you do that, right? So we were one of four districts that did the Hope Mifflin Fuse project, for instance, which is an iPad app. Uh, well, that's great if you've got devices that are, have an eye in front of them or the picture of an apple on it, but not so great for high schools where I have 2,200 Android devices. Right. Uh, and so what has to happen is, is that you have to take a look at the bigger picture, again, using and it's funny I use Algebra 1 because it's my, I'm, I'm horrible at it, but um, Algebra is in terms of the content, and then that might mean if you're carrying an iPad, you're using the Fuse app. It might mean that you're using Khan Academy across the board because it will work on all devices, or you might be using the Android app that those publishers, I guarantee you, are creating in terms of trying to be in that same space. So you have to think about the device, at least in the conversation with your vendors. Uh, a good example is we were using Pearson's uh, Envision Math. Well, it's a flash-based resource when you hand out, and for some reason, which is 
not all hard to, to describe, um, <laughs> iPods and iPads are predominantly used at our K-6 schools. Mm -hmm. Well, can't play the Flash right. resource, so there's got to be another resource. So you've got to be thinking about those type of things. But I absolutely agree that you've got to, not just KD and RUSD, but anyone in this room, unless you're a the opposite, we're 67% free and reduced lunch, 43,000 kids. In good budget times, we couldn't do one-to-one. -one. We are not going to be able to do that in this environment. But, you know, like my student told, told me, he goes, oh, Mr. Reagan, just use Puffin. It, you know, it works well, so, you know, right. they'll find a way around it. Monica, for the because, class. because you kind of work at a, at a state level, I'd, I'd like to just kind of get your input about what states can really do to you know, kind of facilitate this, this process? Well, it, it has to start with, um, at, you know, what states are good at doing, which is creating policies. So the policies have to be... <laughs> Sometimes. I didn't say the policies were good. I said they were good at creating them. Um, so the policies cannot be the things that hold districts and schools back from the kinds of transformations we're talking about. Um, we're working in Missouri with the Missouri School Board Association for the very reason that they have the advocacy units, the lobbyists, they have the folks who can go in and help us make a difference at the policy level of legislators, our State Department of Education, and others, so that there's not a barrier in place. Um, many schools now, or states, Maine is a leader in this, uh, look at their digital content uh, Act that just came uh, 2011. It's great, great example there. Uh, but trying to make sure that seat time isn't uh, standing in the way that the Carnegie units and other things are not uh, barriers to the adoption of uh, either the content or the devices. And then provide, which again our school board association is doing, they're, they're setting up a consortium where school districts can actually come to learn about what devices work well, um, if you're consuming knowledge and, and information, uh, how do you do that? If you're asking people to produce something, it's a little difficult to produce on an iPod. Um, what kinds of things do schools need to have? And those resources and that knowledge has to be shared in a real networked way. Real quick, and then we're going to go to some audience questions. If you wait for policy to change, you're dead already. Yeah. Um, we, we look, we, every policy is compliance based. We meet every compliance. You come to RUSD, I'll send you every compliance that you want to look for. But at the same time, I'm stepping what you haven't defined and I'm working around in terms of getting that done. So we now have time for, for some audience questions. We have mic runners on, on both aisles who can bring a mic to you. So if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand and, and they'll find you. And when you ask your question, please stand up and let us know your name and affiliation. So let's start uh, over here in the back. We'll get to the live stream eventually, Paul. I promise you. <laughs> Hi, uh, I'm Robert Tepork from Team Children. And the question I have is, what do you do about uh, families that don't have computers at home? Darlene or Jay, either one. We, we, uh, we do two things. First of all, we, we find out that they don't because I think the assumption was is that before we did surveys in our district that a far larger percentage didn't have technology or access than the thinking was. So first thing we do is survey. And if you don't have, then we're working to provide, we work with our city, we work with the state, with, with uh, grants, provide that in a way uh, to meet that need. Now, in our case, we're using digital, the replacement of digital, replacement of traditional textbooks going into the digital realm, and that cost saving, which is something you mentioned before, is something that we can now make that switch, provide devices to all for less than we're doing for textbooks uh, in terms of going on. But right now, it's a policy, and, and you know, it's, what you're really getting at is the equity question, right? Um, and unfortunately, and, and this was mentioned earlier as well, unfortunately in education, equity meant everyone gets, this, gets it or no one gets it at all. Uh, and we've got to then step out of that. Equity of access is what we've got to get to. Equity of instruction is what we've got to get to, not equity of everyone gets the same thing. 
and continue to look at those parent, uh, we have parent programs where, you know, we're leveraging our um, vendors to step up to the plate and offer those same types of budget reduced devices to our parents. Uh, that's worked really well. Um, you know, I've, I've been in conversations with um, another vendor, you know, about, you know, offering this device to students for $20 a month and, and uh, the Google Chrome netbook. I mean, it, it, we're going to get there. We're not there today, but we're taking steps to get there. And, you know, that is the number one question that we get when we go and speak to parents. What about the haves and the have-nots? And, and again, we're just trying to leverage the device that you have in your pocket, might have in your pocket already ready and then the stimulus funds and things other funds that we receive title one funds all those different various things will supplant maybe only have to bring in five to ten netbooks or computers into the classroom and it, and it goes back to changing the classroom if you don't have a device for every student what about those collaborative groups that we're supposed to be working in okay <laughs> so yeah <laughs> any other questions let's go up front here uh, <clears throat> John Asenzo, Winslow Township School District in uh, South Jersey. Um, what are the challenges and how is it monitored by the teacher as far as uh, keeping the students on task when the devices are constantly in hand? I mean, I got my spreadsheet open doing my email and all that, multitasking. Oh. How, how, is that a, how is that done and managed? I, you mentioned filters, obviously. Facebook wouldn't be allowed. but. You know how do you, how do you monitor that? Are you saying you've been off task during our discussion? Absolutely. Yes. I think that's yes, what we're going to we're going to put you in the we're going to put you in the corner of the room. Yeah. 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 No, no. We're going to take we're gonna take your computer from you. Can't use it. Uh, no, anybody can. It, use it. It's, it's no different than it was before technology. That's the thing that we've got exactly. to understand. Exactly. Is, is that exactly. The kids were. I was before when I was I was a knucklehead when I was in R, I went to RUSD, right? So I can say this. And when I was off task, it was the same type of thing. I had my notebook, I was doodling, I was, you know, I sometimes would bring sports magazines and look like I'm looking at the textbook, but I'm looking at the sports magazines. That's what I've got here, actually. Right. So, <laughs> so the conception, what you've got to lose is the conception is the teacher is going to become the Internet police, or in fact that we should be the Internet police. Because with the idea that they're carrying this, this uh, and you know, this goes back to your filtering thing, um, our kids are around filters in about five minutes. Um, and they're frankly carrying a network on their pocket. They don't even see the filter half the time. So we've got to be focusing on responsible digital citizenship, not don't go here. Exactly. exactly. How, Monica, how, do you, how do you see the, the kind of battle against that attitude uh, in, in your work? Well, it, it, you know, it's still this whole di idea of you can build a, a stronger filter than then you're in good shape. Well, you know, we have swimming pools in some of our schools and out in our communities. And I know there are fences around those, probably to prevent small children from falling in. But just imagine if you had to build a fence high enough that would keep everybody out of the swimming pool for fear someone might drown. Let's teach them to swim and teach them the digital citizenship that Jay talks about. And then let's use some of the collaborative skills Rather than the teacher or the principal being the police, students can work with each other. And I was in a high school in North Kansas City where the, the kids are the ones who make sure. They, they, they value their ability to access Internet and be part of the real world so much. They police each other. Exactly. It's, it's a well, cool and if it, thing. If it helps you at all, the discipline has not... We haven't changed discipline policies. There's not a technology discipline policy. Yeah. It's the same policy we've always had in place, right. and there hasn't been a significant rise or drop in terms of what happened before we put technology in kids' hands. And uh, teachers can just give those checkpoints. I mean, that's an easy way. They need checkpoints. Let's take a question now from our live stream audience. Paul? All righty, and we got a bunch of questions out there, but uh, one of them comes from L. Hilt on our Twitter feed. And she asks, uh, why do we look for so much outcome data on the effect of using tech tools? Do we ask for outcome data on the use of textbooks? I think we kind of hit that, didn't we? Yeah. <laughs> why don't we, because we, we did kind of talk about that earlier. You have another one? Okay. We'll try one more here. Uh, LJ in our chat room says, uh, do you recommend or currently offer providing teachers uh, their own budget for digital content? What do you guys think about that? In the in the I world, we are doing that currently. So we, if if you are deploying uh, iPods, iPads, um, and we just started doing this Androids, we will create a classroom account for you and populate it with dollars. But we, in our 
our training and our discussion, you, I mean, one, there really is an app for that. Um, <laughs> two, there's too many apps in terms of trying yeah. to figure that out. And then three, there's a ton that are free mm -hmm. that you can use first. So, and, and, and that's kind of the process that we use. There's a great blog by a teacher in Chicago who has found that she can, uh, and the name of her blog is Teach Like It's $29.99. And uh, her, her, whole, her whole premise is that for less than $10 a year, she can have all of her students on apps uh, that are highly educational. She has some great lists on there, too. And relevant, yeah. Is, is there any detriment to kind of creating that, you know, from a theoretical standpoint of creating this separate technology expense fund versus just a educational expense fund? Well, there probably is. Understand, though, that going back to policy, right, when I first went to my business department and said, we're going to buy iTunes gift cards for our teachers, they I had to peel them off the ceiling in terms of uh, what's going on. And so, so by, you know, to meet, again, the compliance, we created that right. account. But I think you're right. And, you know, there, there really is no difference between those type of resources. In our case, it was a compliance and a workaround type of thing. Other questions from the audience? Uh, here in the middle, in the back. Is there a, an, sorry, Ken Bassett from Prince William County in Virginia. Is there an age um, or a gradation in terms of this open access and filtration that you do at the school um, with your, your current practice? I, I have a 12-year-old seventh grader who does not have access to an internet-enabled cell phone, um, and nor does she have access to the internet unsupervised at home. But sounds like I could send her to your school and it'd be free game. Well, again, remember the compliance issues. So we all have to live under the SIPA umbrella, uh, the Child Internet Protection Act, in terms of filtering objectionable material. So while you're on our campuses, that material is filtered. The devices, and we are providing, we are one of the, KD included, are one of the 20 districts in the nation that are providing broadband access away from school. <clears throat> and in that environment, we have, we pretty much use Verizon's movie rating and filtering, so they have a G, PG-13, you know, PG I don't think they have an R, we, at least we're not deploying the R. But this goes back to some of, of what Monica was saying. This is, uh, you, actually we probably talked about this before, mm -hmm. a large part of what we do is we do collaboration with parents and parent training. Because you, mm -hmm. on our devices, if you have a high level concern of what needs to be filtered, we'll give you access to online on guard, the FCC tools, and you can filter to the nth degree if you want <clears throat> in terms of what's going on because when they're in your environment, they're your responsibility. When they're in our environment, they're ours. <clears throat> and so that's kind of how we approach it. But again, the whole discussion, even with your 12-year-old, needs to be about digital citizenship because there will come a time when they're going to be faced with an unfiltered access. And if they don't know how to act, they can get into some very dangerous areas very quickly. Darlene? Yeah, it, it's just like giving your 16-year-old, you're not going to throw the keys at him or her and say, go drive the car. You're going to have a step-by-step -step process to, to learning how to drive and maybe a parking lot first and things like that. Lenny will refer to wrapping our kids in this cocoon um, uh, while we bring them into school and then letting them have the free-for-all in the adult world at, when they go home because we're not always right there with them. Again, it is about the digital responsibility, putting that back on the students and uh, really going through that and making them understand. And we changed ours from an AUP to an R RUG, Responsible Use Guidelines. Again, we want you responsible. You you know, are, are responsible for your learning and getting to the checkpoints and, and to the places that you need to be. Uh, again, it's filtered. We have the device that's filtered at home. Uh, two years ago, the parents, if they didn't have the, the, the actual device, was able to get on their own filtered or their own network at home. This year, it's not. Again, it goes right back through our filtered network um, uh, when the students take that device home. That's, that's with our mobile learning devices. But... Well, meanwhile, they're carrying the devices. For those kids that are carrying the unfiltered devices, they have, they have access to it. Online on guards, FCC's resources, um, I highly suggest you make that available to your students and your parents because some of it is just being trained, like you said. Right. I, don't, 
don't know that if I'm going 80 miles an hour around a corner that necessarily the car is going to roll. Well, so I'd rather see that on a video before I experience that. So, uh, Monica, we have an you know expression in kind of journalism ethics that that appearance of truth is as important as the truth, and if nobody believes what you're saying, it doesn't matter if it's true. Uh, I, I think kind of the same thing, maybe similar in this you know debate about uh, digital citizenship and digital literacy. Uh, as you try to encourage districts to, to go on this journey, you know, how much are, are they believing that you can teach kids to swim? Oh, I, I think there's great proof with districts mm -hmm. like uh, the ones we're seeing here today and really districts all across the United States. There are uh, really outstanding examples that just about any demographic could look at and see uh, you know, a mirror of themselves. And I don't know, it's kind of the, the whole watching someone take a journey down the road. You may not be as far along as they are, but you can certainly see where they've been. And a lot of districts are really beginning to come to grips with this and understand it. Um, and and I, I think that's going to help a lot of others see where to go. Other questions? Uh, here in the middle. Kathy Henley, Cinnaminson School District, South Jersey. I want to ask if you can point me towards what I'll call maybe a dynamic vetting consortium. I don't want to discourage a teacher from going out online and finding some great stuff. Uh, I want a science teacher to look at our local Franklin Institute's great videos on frog dissection, etc. But I also have a responsibility as an administrator to be sure that the content being taught is accurate. So how do you balance that? You talked about um, textbook, uh, our traditional textbook vendors having sites that they uh, put out online content. We can probably trust those. But are there developing consortiums that I can look to to maybe give me a framework of what should be taught? Thank you. I think you can kind of speak to this a bit in Missouri. Oh, sure. Looking at some of the online repositories, learning object repositories, and then finding um, the standards that, that will fit what you need for your district. I think uh, you all probably have learning object repositories that are part of your learning management system. And that does a number of things. It, it allows you to, to approve, for many of them, approve and vet the resources through a process as they come in. And it all it keeps those resources safe then for your teachers so that if uh, the, they click on a URL or go to a video, uh, it's not gone all of a sudden. And you can do the meta tagging just like you would for uh, library resources and standards can be applied, um, curricular standards, many different ways. So I'd encourage you to look at some of the learning object repositories as a way to begin to deal with that. Are there other resources for, for teachers that maybe don't have the, the repository infrastructure, at least in their districts, and I'll, maybe not in their states? I'll let you answer that one, but I want to add to this first. Go, so, go ahead. Um, again, I want to encourage you to you, have to, you have to start to lose the manage and control mentality. Uh, because in my district, the other day I walked into a science classroom, and according to the current adopted resource, Pluto is still a planet. Um, so understand that even in our vetting process, there are things that are inaccurate, et cetera. The, the, the important part is is that we get that information out there. So if you want to talk about last word, Darlene. Right. Um, you know, we do have those vetted resources available to our teachers, and um, but they're still using other resources. And it, it just goes back to, you know, trying to make sure that that teacher is the expert in their content area and making sure that the resources are available uh, to them because they're, when the door's closed, when they're in there teaching their students, they're still going to do what they feel is the most appropriate and just, you know, that accountability. But we do have those resources available to them. Well, Monica, Jay, and Darlene, I'd like to thank you guys for your time today, and, and let's thank them for a really interesting kind of uh, discussion about digital content. <laughs>